Stan Gibalisco here. Uh, I would like to share with you my remembrance of the perfect open wire dipole, uh, a geometer's delight and simplicity uh, as far as you can carry it. I remember this antenna from radio station W1AW in Newington, Connecticut when I worked there in 1979 and 1980. It was served as a backup antenna and it was simply an open wire dipole with a transmatch six inch spaced open wire line running perfectly straight up to a symmetrical dipole antenna roughly uh, f uh, roughly cut for something between 40 and 80 meters. It was somewhere uh, along that line, 66 to 132 feet. I'm not sure exactly how long this was, but it was about that far. Two towers, uh, different beam antennas on each tower, uh, Yagi antennas. I think one of them was a 10 meter Yagi and another one was perhaps a 6 meter Yagi. I don't recall exactly, but insulators here and here providing uh, isolation between the metal towers and the antenna and ensuring that these two lengths, L, were exactly equal. So this was a, a geometer's delight in the sense that the angles here were 90 degrees. Perfectly symmetrical antenna. The tuned uh, feeder had spacers. Six inches porcelain spacers, I believe. But it was open wire line at its best. The transmatch was sort of housed in a in like a dog house down here. Uh, it, it was about the size of a dog house. I wonder how, what the heck kind of a transmatch would take up that much space. How many millions of watts were they planning on running? But sometimes you can get quite high voltages at the feed point of an open wire fed dipole like this. It all depends on the overall combined length here of one side of the dipole and the length of the feed line. If you s happen to get a current node or voltage loop uh, right here at the transmatch, you can end up with some pretty high radio frequency voltages here and you're going to need some pretty large variable capacitors. And by large, I mean physically large with wide apart spaced plates to, so that they won't arc uh, underneath this transmatch was buried a coaxial feed line and I think it was buried under the ground that ran to the station and it was a remotely tuned transmatch so there was another cable along with this coaxial cable to the radios doubtless the very best coax that money could buy it might even be a hard line uh, that was buried down there. But in any case, this was used as a backup antenna. As I said, it ran north and south and on, say, well, today's 40 meter band, it would probably be something between a half and a full wavelength long. But it didn't really matter when you have open wire line like this with loss that low. 90 degree angles here ensure a minimum of antenna currents on the feed line. Keeping the thing away from obstructions of any kind also prevents uh, the disruption of the field from the antenna. It was a model of perfection when it came to a tunable dipole that would operate from roughly 80 meters or 3.5 megahertz all the way up through the well as high as you wanted to go on the HF bands I guess I would would say that 
28 megahertz or 10 meters would be about as high as anybody would ever go. Uh, you get into the VHF bands, you're not going to need uh, this kind of space for an antenna. But it was the, the backup antenna that we used if one of the big beams didn't work. You know, the 40 meter Yagi uh, or uh, either of the, the stacked 20 meter Yagis that we had there at W1AW at the time. And I think they still have a similar antenna system like that to this day and I, I wouldn't be surprised if this dipole is still there uh, some practically 40 years it's my god has it been that long good lord 1979 and 1980 uh, of course the shack was a little more sophisticated than that but it doesn't matter how sophisticated the signal is if the antenna is rotten your signals gonna be rotten and if you don't know how to run your screen capture program, you're going to get artifacts like I just got. I'm uh, kind of rusty at this program, but I'm working on it. It's uh, called Camtasia Studio. It's a very good program, and I'm using Windows Journal as the blackboard, or whiteboard as the case may be, to draw you these active, exciting, adventure-filled videos. But when all else failed, this thing was there, and this thing worked, and it was geometrically perfect. No gain of any kind, but no loss either. Stan Gibalisco proprietor and operator of amateur radio station W1. GV, does that look like a G to you? And then that was my call sign then too, but at W1AW of course we used the call sign W1AW. People always use that call sign and it attracted all kinds of attention and it was like me. We were like DX. You could get on there at night after work and a long day at W1AW. And by then, believe me, I was ready for bed. I couldn't care two hoots or even a half a hoot about whether or not I could be DX to other stations. I wanted my sleep. I worked till one in the morning back in those days. Stan Jubilisco once again saying 73, which means best regards in ham radio jargon, and so long, which, in my native CW fist, shall forever and ever after translate to da-da-da-da-da.